The Big Les Show changed comedy forever, and it certainly changed the left side of my rib forever. Oh yeah, nah. What are you talking about? And as someone who loves The Big Les Show enough to get a tattoo, I really do hope that I can make this video special and transformative, so that even if you've never even heard of the show, that you can gain something from it. And of course, if you're a diehard fan like me, I really do hope that I can provide some new information that maybe you've never even heard of before. The first episode of The Big Life Show was aired to YouTube on the 16th of July 2012, but this had been a project years in the making for Jared Wright, the creator of the show. You see, when Jared was in high school, he would make comics to show his friends on A4 laminated paper, and Jared would show his friends these comics during lunchtime or recess or whenever he could get their attention, and oftentimes Jared's friends would actually come up with great ideas for the cartoons themselves. And many of these inside jokes between friends became iconic characters that we know and love today, such as Sassy the Sasquatch, Big Les, and even Clarence. Oh, and of course, also the Chumas, who were originally designed as messed up Homer Simpsons. And Jared and some of his close friends would have competitions to see who could make the most messed up Homer Simpson. And one day Jared drew a Homer Simpson that was so awful that they decided to name it Clarence. Hey, Vonally. And while Jared was coming up with these comics, one day after school he saw two of his close friends getting into a fight. And one of the friend's dads came to break it all up and he sounded just like Les. So, Jared immediately, in his creative mind, thought that this would be an excellent character. But of course, Jared never wanted to let the friend know that it was his dad that he was portraying as Les, so he changed a few things up, made him a bit wider, bigger, and gave him a pink shirt. And another genius creation that came out of these comics was Sassy the Sasquatch, an all-knowing, immortal, omnipotent Sasquatch, who just can't avoid getting high. And in 2010, God bless the Australian government because they decided nationwide to give every school free laptops. But not just any laptops, really, really small laptops. And although these were supposed to be used for educational purposes, Jared found a much better use for these laptops, Microsoft Paint. And for the next two years, between 2010 and 2012, Jared taught himself the art of animation. And this wasn't regular animation, no. Jared would do all of his animating, frame by frame, on Microsoft Paint, on this tiny, tiny laptop that he was given by his school. And in fact, this is arguably the most impressive part of the Big Les Show seasons one and two, is that everything was done on this tiny laptop. From the animation, to the voiceovers, to the sound effects, to the music, everything pretty much was done by Jared, with the occasional voiceover by his friends. And that's not to discredit his friends at all, because they gave us some incredible voices themselves, such as Scruffy, Owly, and the Chumas. And after those painstaking years of teaching himself animation on Microsoft Paint, Jared uploaded the first three episodes of The Big Les Show to YouTube on the same day. And within a week, the first six episodes of The Big Les Show were all uploaded to YouTube. And the reason for this is because Jared didn't see the Big Les show as some big thing at this time. He just saw it as a laugh between mates. So he just kind of felt like uploading whenever he wanted to because there was no pressure from fans or any external noise. And that's exactly what season one of the Big Les show felt like, a laugh between mates. It was filled with stoner humor and quick gags and most episodes were only between one and two minutes long. However, these one to two minutes were some of the most impactful comedy that YouTube had ever seen, and quickly the show began to gain a cult following. And some of my personal favorite episodes of The Big Les Show actually came from season one, such as the Volcano Bong and Father's Day, that helped to cement characters that we know and love today, such as Big Les, Mike Nolan, and of course, Sassy the Sasquatch. In terms of the narrative for season one, the overarching conflict in this season is Big Les's duel with his brother Norton, but unlike most sibling rivalries, Les and Norton are immortal aliens from the planet Kingdom Come, who are both banished by their father forever to live on Earth amongst the humans. And this ultimately leads to an almighty grudge between the two of them, which starts with Les defecating in Norton's flowers, and Norton, of course, returning the favor. Oh, and there's a Sasquatch called Sassy in the background, but we'll get to him later. I still think that one of the best things about The Big Les Show Season 1 is that you can still see the original username that Jared Wright signed up to YouTube with, 
which is Guitar Fingers 2112, which is seen in the bottom left corner of all the episodes. And throughout season one, we also see a bunch of tumors planted in the background of episodes, foreshadowing the hectic nature of the show to come. You see, Jared's original plan for the end of season one was to have the tumors attack the town of Brown Town and have Les and the rest of the gang fight them off as the season finale. And Jared even had seven minutes of this episode animated with voiceovers and music and sound effects all intact. However, Jared's school was trying to recall the laptops for a little update. And Jared, thinking nothing of it, happily handed his laptop back in. However, once these laptops were returned, Jared was absolutely distraught at the fact that none of his files were saved and all of his work had been destroyed. Of course, not intentionally on the school's part, but it still must have really hurt. And every single scene of that episode was lost apart from this one. My name is Clarence Claymore, and I am documenting these strange creatures that came into the town last night. Lord, please help me know. There's one of them now. Oh. After Jared lost all of his work, he seriously considered quitting making the show. But, thankfully for us, Jared fell in love with the show Lost, which inspired him to rethink the season finale. You see, instead of the Chumas coming to attack the town, Jared thought, why not have Les and the boys go to an island of Chumas, which is exactly what they do. And in this finale of season one, the audience is informed that Les's home planet of Kingdom Come has been destroyed. I'm going back to face my father. Go back? Well, didn't you know? Kingdom Come has been destroyed. And once Les has finished loading his clip into him, he realizes that now is probably a good time to leave the island. So, he runs back to Sassy, Nolan and Donnie, and they take a propeller boat off the island. And there's a great final shot for season one, where we see a mysterious gorilla figure resting in the king's chair atop Truma Island, telling his minion that we must commence war. Which is a pretty chilling cliffhanger that foreshadows a very hectic season two. Season two. Much like season one, Jared made all of the episodes of season two on his small school laptop. Except now, Jared was way more determined to make stories that were rich in substance, because after the end of season one, the Big Les show had now gained a following. And this tone for season two is set straight away via the description of the first episode, in which Jared states that there is more to the Big Les show than a few stoner jokes and a few giggles. And it's this mindset that led to season two being a turning point for the show, with more emphasis placed on character development and progressing the storyline. And one character that gets developed a lot during this season of The Big Les Show is Sassy the Sasquatch. In fact, Sassy hands The Big Les Show their first viral clip, with the Tripper Snipper being shared across Facebook, and naturally making its way to classes, uni dorms, and offices all over the world. And this is where 13 year old Harry from Ends would fall in love with the show. I mean, I still remember being in school quoting the, oh, you know, <laughs> just the use, to all my classmates and showing them the clip, which I just find the funniest thing on the planet. And at this point, I couldn't wait for the show to continue. Throughout season two, the feedback that Jared was receiving was fantastic. And he was being praised for making a big step from season one to try and really up the quality of the character development and storytelling. And through all of these positive comments, one thing remained clear. People really wanted to see Jared take the show an extra step further and really hone in on the animation. And Jared's response to people who asked about the animation was that season three is where the animation will really pick up, which makes a lot of sense. Because during the making of The Big Les Show season two, Jared was actually working as an overnight janitor at a local cinema with his friend Tom. And no doubt at this time, he was just trying to save enough money to be able to afford a great piece of animation kit and just wanted to get season two over and done with to progress the storyline and the characters before he could really upgrade the animation. Anyway, back to season two. The narrative of season two of The Big Les Show revolves around Les winning massive on the pokies and now finally has enough money to complete his spaceship. But of course, this doesn't go off without a hitch. Les is arrested for assaulting his neighbor Norton and killing a bag of puppies. And one of the things I love about this episode is that the court scene excellently parodies the Shawshank Redemption. You strike me as a particularly icy and remorseless man, Mr. Mackerel. It chills my blood just to look at you. And if you look around you, you'll see nothing but nerds. Mm-hmm. But just because Les is in jail, 
it doesn't mean that he'll be short of any company. Because shortly after Les is imprisoned, Sassy and the boys are pulled over by the police. And during a search of Sassy's boot, the policeman finds everything under the sun. And once everyone is reunited in prison, they meet Sergio Warnington, accompanied by Clarence, who agrees to tell Les about the tumours. Right after this cliffhanger. And this cliffhanger lasted for two and a half months. I mean, I've got to tell you, I really envy the people who can watch The Big Les Show nowadays because boy, was it rough waiting for each episode back in the day. So, back to season two. Sergio tells Les that there's an outbreak of tumours and he plans on hunting them down, at which point a massive tumour bursts through the prison doors and the boys, including Sergio and Clarence, escape in a getaway car, driven by Sergio's cousin, Warning Guy. At this point, Les's spaceship has now been fixed and is situated inside the volcano bong. And with a little bit of fuel from Sassy's tripper snipper, they can finally head off into space. And as previously mentioned, Les discovers that his home planet of Kingdom Come is destroyed. Which, in my opinion, gives birth to one of the best Big Les show quotes. Take a good hard look. Gone. Over. Finn. And upon returning to planet Earth, the spaceship is attacked by a tumor. And Les and the rest of the boys crash back down to Earth, which is now being attacked by an army of tumors. With one of these tumors bringing Les to the mysterious figure that we saw at the end of Tumor Island 1, who we now find out is called Cecil. Oh, and another bombshell, Les's father is the one that destroyed Kingdom Come. I mean, this show has more twists and turns than Rainbow Road on reverse on 360 no scope mode. And it's this frantic, fast-paced storytelling that perfectly encapsulated the vibe of the first two seasons. Because Jared was animating all of this on his school computer pad frame by frame, the stories needed to be told rather quickly. Otherwise, Jared may well have rubbed all of the skin off of his fingers animating. So, season two ends with Les's father taking Cecil on his spaceship, after stating that Cecil is the next in line to be king of Kingdom Come. And before Les can attack them, they fly away in his spaceship. But Les does get to have one victory at the end of season two, as he knocks out Norton and takes back his son Quentin. And there's a happy ending of season two for Quentin as well, as Les finally buys Quentin that bloody game box thing he's been wanting this whole time. So, did Jared live up to his comment that he was going to upgrade the animation for season three? Yes. Yes, he did. In fact, Jared upgraded the animation from season two to season three so much that all of the comments were filled with positivity. And having a new animation style and setup no doubt helped Jared in producing the episodes at a faster rate. And the quality difference between season two and season three of the show was night and day. Season three of The Big Les Show is my personal favorite because by this point, Jared had gotten all the characters, storyline and animation down and he was just having fun. I mean, these episodes were so great because they were all about showcasing all of the characters' unique personalities. With incredible lines from Sassy in episode one. Like that thing is a one-way ticket to the astral plane, but it feels like you got two tickets. Mike Nolan getting the spotlight in episode two, which in my opinion is a top five episode altogether. Clarence the Potato Head getting episode three, which birthed so many of the show's best quotes, such as, Fiddy Bucks. Oh, oh no, it, it's for the orphans. And now we get to episode four. So before in this video, I mentioned that Jared was an overnight janitor at a cinema with his friend Tom. Well, one of the jobs that Jared would do frequently was hoovering up after screenings would finish. And he'd often hoover up popcorn and coins. And if you're a diehard fan of the show, you probably know what comes next. Oh, you should have got some popcorn like me. Some what? Popcorn. Yeah, popcorn, mate. Isn't it popcorn? Nah, mate. It's popcorn. I'm pretty sure it's popcorn. I've never heard of that word in my entire life, mate. It's popcorn. Arguably the most viral soundbite from the entire show, this episode is hilarious and plays off of Sassy's blissful fogginess perfectly, and also parodies Family Guy's Cool Whip in a light-hearted way. And something else very significant happens in this episode, the first trippy psychedelic scene accompanied by music, which is ultimately used to fuel Les's journey, with Les's subconscious telling him that he needs to return to Truma Island. And at this point, you may be thinking, what did Les spend all of that money that he won on the Pokies on? Well, he spent it on Glendalls, and these will play an integral part of the storyline later. But before that, we get the final short form episode of season three, Clarence's backstory, where once stood an important doctor with girls practically throwing themselves at him, now lays Clarence, who has to live as a punching bag. 
And Clarence also explains how he accidentally dropped his tumor test tube into a massive ditch, leading to the inception of the tumors. And my favorite part of this penultimate episode is when Les and Donnie break the fourth wall about how long it's going to take for Tumor Island 2 to come out. So the next episode is Tumor Island 2, mate. Yep. It's gonna go for about 20 mins or something. Or there'll be some people out there whinging about the wait for the next episode. But Jared couldn't have possibly anticipated what was going to come next. You see, Jared was, in his own words, playing around with psychedelics. And during one of his trips, had what was known as a Kundalini awakening, where you become this white light and achieve a higher state of being. And this experience really traumatized Jared in a sense, and he was going through a very tough time mentally, with his brother and girlfriend being the main people that he would lean on for support during this time. And Chuma Island 2 was essentially Jared's rock, which would center him back to having a purpose and giving him something fulfilling to work on. And Jared himself even calls Chuma Island 2 his baby, because it took nine months to make. So, nine months later, on the 21st of August 2015, Chuma Island 2 was aired on YouTube, and it came in at a whopping 55 minutes, far longer than the 20 minutes that Jared hinted at at the end of the previous episode. And Chuma Island 2 became Jared's magnum opus, hands down the best installment in an already great Big Les universe, combining everything that makes the show so special, such as the edgy humor and the storytelling and the fighting scenes. And of course, the reason that this episode will live on forever, Les's Awakening. This scene is so intelligently done and emotionally impactful because it mirrors our reality, with Jared writing Sassy's lines as a way to talk himself through his own kundalini awakening, telling Les and the viewer that we are all stuck inside a proverbial box and that we control our own fate, quoting the famous Beatles song, Think for Yourself. This scene completely changed my life when I first saw it. It restructured the way I thought about my existence and judging by the comments, many other people were also profoundly affected by this scene. So, back to the storyline. Les is hunting down Norton and gets him to admit that he's working with their father and that they were working with Clarence on a formula to create super soldiers. But the project was scrapped because the formula exploded and Chumas escaped from the tube. And those Chumas that escaped in turn attacked Kingdom Come, causing the planet to implode on itself. Norton then goes on to explain that their father is gathering the Chumas to use as a weapon for a secret project and asks Les to join him. And Les's answer is an emphatic no, killing Norton and pushing him off of a cliff. And while Les was busy giving Norton a sorting, Warning Guy takes care of Cecil, and the crew flies up and away, only to realize that Chuma Island is an actual giant Chuma. But not to worry, Clarence is on deck at the bottom of Chuma Island with some of Sassy's sassy foods, which he uses to explode the island. And so, the boys all reunite on the beach, proud of their work. But Mr. Harry from Ends, didn't the Mike Nolan show come after season three? Yes, yes it did. But the Mike Nolan show, Mike Nolan's Long Weekend, and the Sassy show are all deserving of their own videos. And this video is purely about the Big Les show. So, 19 months and one Comedy Central spin-off later, season four is released to YouTube with a far greater emphasis on animation than we had ever seen before. And season four of The Big Lies Show really started with an aura of suspense. And I'll be honest, when I first watched the season four opener, I was worried that the show was going away from its roots and that the comedy was being put second to the animation. But retrospectively, this episode set up a lot of the action that was still yet to come, essentially building a solid, well-animated foundation for the rest of the season to grow out of. And I still remember in 2017, when the season four opener came out, that the Big Les subreddit was full of theories as to who Taipan Pete could possibly be, with most people on the subreddit speculating that it was either Quentin grown up, or sassy, or some kind of King Larinox. And now we move on to episode two. Episode two of season four of the Big Les show is very reminiscent of Truma Island 2, with Les being sent to a different dimension. Except this trip has a much more light and upbeat feel, focusing on manifestation. But, just when Les thinks he's on top of the universe and has achieved peace, he remembers that Quentin is still in danger, with the Trumas slowly taking over the town. So, Les heads back to Brown Town, and once he gets back, he accidentally pulls Clarence out of the ground, and then heads back into his house, only to discover that Quentin isn't there and Glen World is all gone. So, episode three rolls around, and Les makes his way into Norton's house and calls his father. And on the phone call with his father, he tells him that he killed Norton and that he's coming for him, with the pair naturally going back and forth over the telephone. And just like that, 
four longer, well-animated episodes of season four later, we arrive at the end of the season. Which is of course accompanied by the fourth wall being broken yet again, with the audience being informed that Chuma Island 3 is going to take a very long time to come out. And a long time it did take. In fact, it was by far the longest wait between episodes of the entire show, clocking in at one year, one month, and two days. The wait was so long in fact, that I had finished my GCSEs, moved schools, and started my A-levels by the time that the Big Life Show finale came out. But boy, was it worth it? And the finale clocked in at one hour and six minutes, which even outdid Chuma Island 2's 55 minutes in terms of runtime. And just like Chuma Island 2, the third and final installment has an incredible feel to it, from the music to the animation and of course the storyline. Everything just fell into place perfectly for this finale. So let's talk about the storyline. It turns out that everyone on the Big Les subreddit was incorrect on their Taipan Pete predictions, or at least so it seems. As it turns out that Taipan Pete is a mere figment of Les's white bellflower induced hallucinations. And I personally love the fact that Jared shouts out some of the most popular subreddit theories when Les is in this state. What are you, Quinn from the future or something? Crazy Steve's dead. King Larinox in the scars or something. So, after the boys discover Les on the railroad tracks, they pick him up. And once Les has regained consciousness, he sings the now iconic Brown Town song. Sassman come up to me and he says, Wanna go fishing, Les? And I said, you know what? Mm, why not? And eventually, after many hours of train travelling, Les and the gang reach the island. And once they're on the island, Les sees Quinton tied up, so he runs after him. But this is a carefully placed trap, and Les is beamed up into his father's spaceship. Meanwhile, Sassy and Donnie get beamed up into another kind of stratosphere, as they get very, very high. And Sassy and Donnie end up in an infinite time loop with John Lennon, which makes a lot of sense because the Beatles are an incredible source of inspiration for Jared, with the Beatles song Think For Yourself being mentioned in Les's Chuma Island 2 Awakening, and the Yellow Submarine documentary also being mentioned in the show. Okay, so back to Les. Les is now face to face with his father, who reveals that Glenn from Glenn Dolls is actually his partner, and that all of the money that Les has been spending on Glenn Dolls has actually been funding his father's mischievous schemes. However, that isn't the end of the drama, as Glenn double crosses Les's father and drops him and Les to their demise. This ends up sending Les into a trip with Taipan Pete, who delivers Les a crushing ultimatum. You see, it turns out that Taipan Pete might not just be a figment of Les's imagination after all, as Taipan Pete informs Les that he has seen the version of reality where Les becomes king, and that Les creates unknown havoc, and ultimately becomes an even bigger threat to the planet than any of the other kings. So, Taipan Pete tells Les that the only way to avoid this fate is to blow himself up, which would save his friends and family, but ultimately would mean that he would die. So, after Les comes back from this trip, he turns Super Saiyan, and beats his father to the verge of passing. There's even a brilliant moment right here where Les goes to pick up the crown, and the audience thinks that maybe Les has turned evil, and will let his hubris take over and become king. However, Les uses this crown to stab his father. And another thing that I love about this sequence between Les and his father is that it perfectly reflects everything that Sassy said would happen to Les if he decided to kill Norton during Les's awakening in Chuma Island 2. It's even the same gun that kills Les that he used to kill Norton, with his father pulling the old gooch gun trick and shooting Les multiple times in the chest. At this point, with multiple bullets in his chest, Les sends the nuke to hit the island. And thankfully, Mike Nolan is able to save Quinton, and everyone gets off the island. Of course, apart from Les. And we get this incredibly beautiful shot of Les's final moments, where Les is able to look at the entire earth as his life flashes before his eyes. At this point, we return back to Sassy and Donnie, who have now entered the first dimension. And actually, one of the funniest moments of this trip is Sassy and Donnie poking fun at how season 1 and 2 were animated. But after that, Sassy gets transported into real life and has to hitchhike a ride. And the best part about this scene is that the person giving Sassy a lift is actually Jared's brother, who in real life was actually late to a personal training session, but still took the time to film this scene with his brother. And that's why at the end of this scene, Sassy says, I saw your life at work and everything. <laughs> when leaving the car. After this scene is complete, we are transported 13 months later, which is a very clever nod to how long the episode took to animate and release. 
And after Sassy and Donnie find out about Les's passing, they all mourn Les's death and read out his final letter, which was sent 13 months prior. And after all of this reflection, the Trumas make a return. However, this time it's not to attack Browntown, but rather to apologize for all of the actions that have taken place previous. The boys all read Les's farewell letter, and Quinton looks over it once more, before getting called out by Sassy, Nolan, and Donny to go surfing. And after a few moments of reflection, he does. Showing not only has Quinton gotten over his fear of crabs and water from season 1, but that he's now going to live his life in the fullest, just as Les did. And just like that, the Big Les show finishes on such an incredible note. So, if you widen the scope and look at the Big Les show as a whole, you'll see a show that once started off as a comic that Jared would show his friends, and just had fun messing around with, to a show that then eventually got posted to YouTube under the username GuitarFingers2112, which contained mostly short sketches and stoner humour to show his friends. And the authentic nature and hilarity of the sketches led the show to gaining an audience, and ultimately led Jared to focus more on the storyline for season 2. And by the start of season 3, the show had gained a lot of fan love, and Jared repaid this love by polishing the animation and giving people catchphrases and funny episodes that will live on forever. And at the end of season 3, we arguably got the magnum opus of the show, Chuma Island 2, which set a whole new standard for comedy and storytelling as an art form, and changed so many lives for the better, including mine. And by the time we got to season 4 of The Big Les Show, the show had just evolved so much, to the point where every episode felt like its own movie, with Truma Island 3 bringing me to tears even after the first time of watching it. Which, judging by the comments, was not an uncommon phenomenon. I was 13 when I first started watching The Big Les Show, and now I'm a 23 year old man. I mean, it's crazy how time flies, and I just want to say a massive thank you to Jared Wright and everyone who was ever involved in making The Big Les Show for ultimately making something that is so special and took years to animate. Because all of the effort that you guys put into the show made countless people's lives better. Also, a little bit of a side note here. If anyone knows where I can get any of these Big Les Yuli brews, I've been looking for them everywhere and I haven't been able to find them anywhere. And as always, stay classy, stay humble, stay funny.